Many people will come in, they're very facile with their words, but when we try to nudge into the visual imagination, or even asking them a little bit about their fantasies, it's as if there's a sentinel at the gate. How do you facilitate that process of individuation with the primacy of image? Jung says this, you, you, you don't know what the creative outcome of this is going to be. The creative function in human beings is that function. It's the capacity. That doesn't mean you have to be an artist. It doesn't mean you have to play a violin or do drawings or anything like that. Image isn't something that we have before us. We're in it. We're in it at the same time we look at it. So when we think of image, we think of a picture. But we are living these dramas. Our lives are dramatic enactions of, of our life's drama, of our development, and of the archetypal powers. So Mark, in your work, in a consulting room, how do you facilitate that process of individuation with mm-hmm. the primacy of image? Sure. Because one of the things that I notice, even with my own analysis, is that Many people will come in, they're very facile with their words. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps they don't even remember their dreams that frequently. Mm-hmm. But when we try to nudge into the visual imagination, or even asking them a, a little bit about their fantasies, it's as if there's a sentinel at the gate <laughs> mm. that, makes it, <laughs> that makes it really difficult. Or at least, even if it's not difficult for them to experience it, perhaps it's difficult for them to say it. Yeah. So how do you negotiate this sentinel at the gate? That's a great question, Joseph. Mm. I think first and foremost for me is, uh, and you know, I've been through enough analysis <laughs> and I have had the experience. And I think that's one of the things why we go through so much analysis and training is because if it's real for us, we have a foundation in it. Mm. Um, I like what Jung has to say in the transcendent function that the analyst mediates the transcendent function, meaning that the analyst has to have within him or her the capacity to span between worlds, or else the analyzan is never going to achieve that. Mm. So there there may be lots of Mm. impediments uh, for people um, to, to find ways to access that in themselves. But the first and foremost, my answer to your question would be, the analyst has to be um, aware that the psyche is always purposive. And so uh, whatever is manifesting then is part of psyche's plan and part of psyche bringing image forward in a guiding way. Um, now, one of the things when we talk about, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to? Yeah, you know, I want to, this is so rich, Mark, and, I, and please don't lose where you were, but just to mm-hmm. expand on what you were just saying, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, first of all, can, can we talk about kind of what the transcendent function is? We've certainly thrown that term around on the podcast, but it might be good to try to uh, m- yeah. make that more explicit for people. And also, I'm just, I'm just thinking about how I love that kind of vision of what the analyst's job is, because it's, it's not directive. Right. It's sitting with the possibilities that come up yes. from the unconscious and being open yes. to that. So can you just, or, or maybe we can all work on sort of defining the transcendent function and maybe how that even happens in the consulting room. Sure. I'll give some of my perspective, which is incomplete. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, like yourselves, every, I've read that essay <laughs> yeah. a lot of yeah. times. <laughs> and every time I read it, you know, I look at my highlights, and, and, and then I realize I yeah, pretty much have the whole thing highlighted, uh, because almost every <laughs> word is, is profound, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And this really dovetails with so many things. You, you're going to get me started here, and I won't stop. Um, <laughs> but I'll it's try. great to. stuff, so don't stop. Um, we become divided. In the process of adaptation, we become divided against our natures. We accentuate certain aspects of ourselves, and we push away other aspects of ourselves. Mm -hmm. But all of those things are part of ourselves. They are part of our faculties. And in the neurotic uh, formulation, an individual will have a conscious identification with certain contents and disidentify with other contents, and this sets up a conflict in the psyche. Um, Mm -hmm. It is for the analyst, however, uh, Jung uses the term unconscious. I sometimes chafe at that. 
Uh, it is it is unconscious, um, but I actually find with most of my analysands that they they know yeah. what this other aspect of themselves is. They just don't know what it's about or how mm-hmm. to relate to it. So I have to be the interpreter in a way. I have to take it seriously. I have to draw their attention to it because in that conflict uh, between those things, the analyst is going to hold to the veracity, the authenticity, the, um, the absolute necessity from, life, from the point of life um, that, that what is challenging the ego's assumption about itself is also has a say, that the unconscious or this other aspect also has a say. Mm-hmm. Now, this all gets very interesting because, as I mentioned before with Gene Gebser, and I think in Jung it's very, very clear, and I think if you take the two and put them together, you really realize that they have a very mm. common map, that the two parts of the psyche don't speak the same language. Mm-hmm. You know? Yep. They don't, right. you know. Um, and so it's important for the analyst to be able to, to do everything you can yeah. to try to take what this other unconscious part is saying and take it seriously and not dismiss it and try to divine what it is it's trying to express. Mm-hmm. And so that effort, this is what Jung says, he says, you know, uh, the analyst's role is to, is to mediate the transcendent function, meaning that your growth as an analyst, your per- growth in perception, your capacity to be open to, to something new that you've never seen before is a vital aspect of the analytic process. My client, or my analysand, uh, uh, doesn't see it, but I need to, as best I can as best I can. So in the transcendent function, there is a coming together of these two things. Now, what becomes difficult about that is that typically I find analysand say, well, I'll take this side of me and I'll take that side of me and I'll do a little bit of both and put them together and I'll figure this out. I've never seen it work that way. (laughs) What I see is that something that you could not have foreseen shows up as if out of nowhere. Yes. You know? And, and Jung says yeah. this. I mean, he mm-hmm. says, you know, you, you, you don't mm-hmm. know what the creative outcome of this is going to be. However, speaking as, as we're talking about art and imagery and psyche, the creative function in human beings mm-hmm. is that function. It's the capacity. Yes. That doesn't mean you have to be an artist. It doesn't mean you have to play a violin or do drawings or anything like that, you know. So uh, just to give you an example, Joseph, of, of kind of a way that I might work with that, you know, I will in my work. Uh, 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 hold on, there's another thing that I think maybe I should say that might mm-hmm. help to kind of organize this. Image isn't something that we have before us. We're in it. We're in it at the same time we look at it. Mm, so when we that. think of image, we think of a picture. But we are living these dramas. This is what, mm-hmm. this is what Harari is talking about. Yeah. Right? Our, our, our lives are dramatic enactions of of our life's drama, of our development, and of the archetypal powers. Uh, this is something that Nathan Schwartz Salant uh, nailed, I think, more beautifully than anybody I know. He says, each of our lives are individually lived, but they're actually a drama of greater powers lived through us. Uh. You know? And so what's going on in, uh, in a case, even if somebody doesn't have a dream, the drama of their life can be read like a book. It can be read like a painting. And you can look sure. at the components of it and realize the drama and the image world that they are caught in, right? So, um, and these things will show up. And sometimes what I will do is I will move from the rational world. Okay, let's just say, you know, somebody has, um, you know, something going on in them that's a feeling that, um, uh, that they don't want and they have no relationship with. Well, what I will do sometimes, and speaking of art therapy, um, mm-hmm. I will have them visualize it as a being. Now, what am I doing there? Well, I'm moving it from the rational world to the mythic world. Mm. The mythic world populates our lives, populates uh, our worlds with, with qualities that are personifications that then enable us to be able to relate to the contents. So, so just as a very clear example, I might say, well, you know, can you go online and find an image that you think 
captures how angry、mm. you feel of a person、Ooh. or a creature.、Mm. You know, and then they'll bring it in, and we'll begin working on it. And、um, just that process of suddenly establishing a relationship through those means to something that seems so foreign changes everything. That just happens、mm-hmm. over and over again. You know, once you make that move, and consciousness is then able to kind of say, "Oh, yeah, when I look at that image of my anger, I see hurt, right? Or I see grief, or I see、mm-hmm. loss." You know, and I and and you know, it just brings it up because the psyche and imagery, imagistic processes are constellative or constellational in nature, meaning that they're always drawing together a lot of contents from a lot of different directions to create their singularity. So that's one of the ways that I I, I may work with those things. Yeah, and one of the things、uh, that strikes me about that, Mark, is that. You can do this work on online. I mean,、um, yes. You know, there's there's been this discussion that we've been somewhat involved in since the pandemic. Is you know, can you can can an online virtual encounter constellate all of this? And and do do you work? Is your practice partially online? My my practice is primarily online now.、Okay. Um, you know, I've been I've been involved in a move, so I'm resituating myself, but. Um, yeah, I, I work primarily online.、Okay. Um, I, I have a gentleman that I work with. You can do it with drawing too. I mean, or, or any any kind of expression. Sometimes、mm-hmm. people, as you guys know, will say, "Oh God, you know, there was this film, you know, and there was this section where you know Carrie reaches up and grabs the girl at the end of the movie, you know, and、mm-hmm. and there it is, you know." And I'll say, "Well,、okay. let's watch it, you know. Let's look at that together." I have a gentleman that I'm working with now who, you know, just had a horrific childhood, and um, um, you know, I、uh, he had a dream, and from the dream、uh, there was an abstract something hanging behind his back, you know, as he was watching something in the dream, and I said, "Bring it forward, you know, let's see what that looks like, right?" And he did that, and then we went to another. It was like a Rubik's cube or something, you know, it was something. Abstract. He couldn't get his his mind around it,、um, so it was very much lodged in the feeling world, which doesn't necessarily have a form. And then I asked him to make a personification of it. And Jung says, speaking of the transcendent function, you don't have to have any ability. I can guarantee you, after many years of doing art therapy, artistic ability and psych- psychological expression are not one and the same. You know the simplest things by kids will blow your mind. <laughs> what's in that artwork? So it it doesn't require any skill,、um, you know, to do that. And what came out of this、uh, this image for this man, I think, was really important and profound in his work.、Um, no skill needed. <laughs> 